Hello everyone, welcome to MD Prospect. Let's just cut to the chase. Here are 10 study techniques that I swear by as a medical student. They help me get into medicine and I use these on a day-to-day -day basis. Here's a timestamp of what I'm going to talk about. Half of them focus on the actual study techniques and the other half focus on the study mentality, which is just as important. Let's start with the first one. First, you gotta study from the testable core materials outwards. So let's say the box represents all the information that is presented to you and the star in the middle is the testable material. Someone who doesn't know how to study will go from top to bottom, covering every single little detail. And when the exam time comes, they haven't covered like 20 to 30% of what is testable. Whereas someone who knows how to study will start from the middle, you know, study from the core materials that is testable and then study outwards. And when the exam time comes, although they haven't studied everything, they studied what is important and what is testable. I know that you want to be the best student as possible. I want to be the best doctor as possible. So when studying, we have this tendency to try to learn everything. Um, but we have to make this mindset shift from focusing on those long-term goals to short-term goals. And those short-term goals when you're taking courses is to pass and get good grades in every midterm and every, every exams that is presented before you. And then those long-term goals will take care of themselves. So how do you know what's testable or not? There are three ways of figuring that out. First is to look for practice tests or previous tests. Sometimes the lecturers give you, you know, a couple questions at the end of their lecture uh, to go over on. Pay attention to those. I also looked online in undergrad to uh, figure out if there were any practice tests lying around. Uh, I asked seniors if they've taken the course and if they had any practice material. I asked my friend who's also taking the course, you know, you, you gotta use your resources to figure out if there are any additional uh, study materials that you can use. Number two, go to lectures and pay attention to the lecturers. Whether that is in medicine or in undergrad, they always tend to say things like, hint, hint, or I bolded this word for a reason. You know, pay attention to those and highlight them in red in your PowerPoint so that when you go back, you know what's important. And third, you have to think like an examiner, not a learner. So when you're going over the material, always imagine in your mind, how can I test this in a multiple choice format? How can I test this in a short answer format? And then try to learn that way. Number two on the list is to write good concise notes and then plan out your timing for all your midterms and all your exams and then constantly evaluate as you're studying so that you're not falling behind. So for example, let's say you're taking five courses and before a midterm you have to go over 10 lectures per course and then each lecture has 50 slides. That totals up to 2,500 slides that you have to go over before a midterm. So you have to write a good concise note that summarizes everything that makes it manageable for you to go over the materials before you write the midterms so that you're not overloaded. Try to write notes as concise as possible containing keywords and important information. You know that if you don't remember something from your note, you, can, you have the PowerPoint slides that you can always fall back on. Thankfully in medicine, I didn't write any notes because there was a guy named Michael in the upper years who wrote fantastic notes for every lecture, for all the rotations. So I just supplemented with uh, lecture slides and textbooks. Again, when you're going over your notes, always start from the core testable material outwards and then use active recall, which is my third point, to figure out what you don't know so that you study those and focus on those before anything else. Number three on the list is to use active recall when learning. I made a video on this previously that you can watch, but let me expand on that further here. Let me start off by giving you examples of students who don't know how to study. So when presented with an information like mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, what they do is, without thinking, they just write. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. The second student, also without thinking, just blankly stares at the screen and reads the information. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And then they move on. Nothing's coming into their brains. So what I do when I'm going over my notes is what I read the information, I write only the keywords, and then as opposed to looking at my notes, I look at that keyword, for example, what is mitochondria? And then I try to think mitochondria is the powerhouse, powerhouse of the cell. Why is it the powerhouse of the cell? And then I try to supplement information from the lecture. It is the powerhouse of the cell because it produces ATP. Um, so I'm using all of my senses. I'm writing down, which is my you know, tactile motion. I'm saying things out, which is verbal. I'm looking at my notes previously. I'm using my visual cues. And I'm, as I'm saying it, I'm listening. So I'm using also my auditory uh, senses. And most often when you're actively recalling, you cannot remember all the information. 
And that is okay because studies have shown that just by attempting to recall, you, you're creating that connection between the information and your memory. And that is actually good for you because you know what you don't know by trying to, trying to recall. So when I'm, when I'm thinking through something like uh, ATP is produced in the mitochondria, but I can't really remember how that works. So what I do is I look back at my notes, I quickly read through that, and then I try to take a moment to verbalize again. Okay, mitochondria creates ATP this way and that way. And number four, I cannot emphasize this enough, reviewing is just as important as learning new information. So if I have 20 lectures to go over before a midterm, for example, as opposed to going one to 20 and then going back to one to 20, what I do is I go to uh, one to five and then I review one to five quickly and then move on to six to 10. And then once I'm done six to 10, even more quickly, I go over one to five and then I look over, look over six to 10 and then I go on to 11 to 15. Obviously, you have to time this correctly before a midterm so that you actually cover everything. Uh, in undergrad, I went over all the material at least two or three times before writing the test. Another thing that I do with reviews is that uh, before starting a new study session every day, I spend 10 to 15 minutes going over what I learned uh, on the previous day. Uh, it's hard to get into a study rhythm when you're starting off with fresh new material that you're not familiar with. Whereas if you're studying, spending 10 to 15 minutes going over what you've already learned yesterday, then you, it's easier to get into the study rhythm and you're you know, knocking, down, knocking down all the reviews that you've done already. Number five is more of a mentality thing. You have to study harder for your midterms than your final exams. You're gonna obviously study hard for your final exam, but you have to study harder for your midterms because that sets the tone for the entire course. Let's say you got a bad mark on a midterm, then the entire course is just a catch up game. You're worrying the whole time, probably two to three months, uh, worrying about whether you're gonna get a good enough final mark so that you can make up for getting a bad mark on your midterms. In medicine, we don't really have midterms, we only have quizzes, so it doesn't really apply here. But in undergrad, I remember thinking the start of the semester is way more important than the final stretch of the semester. Number six is having a strong mindset throughout school year. I'm gonna come across as a little harsh here, but you know the saying, you just gotta try your best. I would say that you gotta be the best. Is your best really the top 1% of your class? Is your best the top 5% of your class? If the program that you want to get into in the end has less than 10% acceptance rate, is being top 20% of your class good enough for you? No. So if you want something, you gotta get after it, and then you will start producing good results, and then you will build confidence along the way. Number seven is putting the work in and outworking everyone, which is kind of counterintuitive to put it in this video because this is a study technique video. But compared to someone who knows all these study techniques but doesn't work hard, um, someone who doesn't know any of these techniques and is just putting the hours in studying and getting the information into their brain is always gonna beat that person with better study techniques. I wasn't the brightest person in my class, so what I did was I just literally outworked everyone. How do I know that? I walked into a library before everyone else and I walked out of the library after everyone else. I spent my time studying on Friday nights, Saturday nights when everyone was going out partying and there was you know, one other student that was leaving the library at the same time late night and he's now a cardiac surgery resident at U of A. So uh, things like that happen. So you just have to outwork everyone if you really want to be successful. And once in a blue moon, you'll come across guys who are just naturally, genetically gifted and smart. Um, I remember in high school, there was a guy who was coding things into his calculator to solve specific set of physics questions for fun. You know, I'm never gonna be able to compete with guys like that. You know, but those guys make up only 0.0001% of the population. So the rest, you are guys just like me or you. So you just have to outwork them and try to forget about competing against that genius. Number eight is getting a serious study partner and friend who wanted as bad as you. If you think it's gonna be hard to find them, well, if you start studying late nights at a library all the time, you tend to come across these guys. It's hard coming in early in the morning and leaving late at night, coming in on weekends. But in undergrad, I had a group of friends who I really studied with and we didn't really disturb each other. We, when, we, when it was time to study, we studied, we didn't interrupt each other. And when, it was, when the business was taken care of, we went out and had fun. Um, now, one guy, is, one guy that I studied with is in Harvard uh, doing oral maxillofacial surgery residency. 
Uh, most of my friends are in medicine. Um, so we were serious about our business and uh, we kept each other accountable and we kept each other supported. Number nine is staying consistent and staying on top of everything, especially in medicine where there's like million things going on. If I start to lose track of things, I get super stressed. So I have to be on top of every email. I have to be on top of every, you know, assessments and all the work that I have to do. In undergrad, you're dealing with five courses plus your extracurriculars and everything going on. So you have to stay on top of things so that you don't fall behind and get stressed. Let me give you an example of consistency and why it is so important. You have student A and student B. You know, student A is working Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, 12 hours each. Student B decides to work on Friday but takes Saturday and Sunday off. Then that student B has fallen behind student A by 24 hours. Um, so no matter how hard he tries, you know, the next on Monday studying 14 hours as opposed to 12 hours, on Tuesday studying 16 hours, that guy is always playing catch up to student A. And when you're on a curve in university and undergrad, you're just gonna not be able to compete against student A. Same thing applies in medicine, in residency, at work. You know, you gotta start laying the foundations now that no matter how hard they try, if everyone's working 100 hours a week in residency, then you know where's the room to grow compared to someone who's laid the foundation in med school, right? So you just gotta stay consistent and put the work in. Number 10 is effectively controlling your anxiety and your worry uh, when you're going through school. I'm gonna make a more detailed video on this later, but I'm gonna quickly brush over this right now. Obviously, if you have clinical depression or anxiety, that's something that you need to attend to more seriously, but I'm just generally talking about students um, having general you know, anxiety when they're competing for a competitive spot in a certain program that they want to get into. There are two types of warriors. One is someone who doesn't study and is worried about not studying. That The solution to that is simple. You just gotta study. <laughs> Number two, the second type of warrior is um, someone who worries despite having done all their studies. And when you're in that position, then you need to uh, write down what you're worried about. So on a notebook, on an iPad or whatever, you're, you're worrying because you're not seeing what you're worried about. So divide a line halfway in the middle, um, write down what you can control and what you cannot control. And something like what you can control is waking up early, going to the library and studying for X amount of hours and staying focused when you're studying. What you cannot control is the actual grades that I'm gonna get uh, from this course. So if I'm worried, oh, am I gonna get a B? Am I gonna get a B plus? Am I gonna get an A minus, A, A plus? You cannot control that. Just focus on what you can control and you just have to give up on what you cannot control. That's it guys. I'm not out here trying to compete at a memory competition. You know, there are so many different study techniques like creating a memory palace and all that. You don't need all that. I would say, you know, strong dedication putting you know, hard work in every time, creating good study habits and sticking to it is way more important than knowing all these good study techniques. But if you know all these study techniques and you have that good study work ethic, then you're studying on, staying on top of things. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you haven't liked the video, please click the like button for YouTube algorithm. Subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see you guys soon.